Hello, friends. Uh, it's your Chapo for the week. Uh, it's me, Will, here. I'm uh, going to kick things off with a, a very interesting interview. Uh, you might remember on our most recent episode, we ended with about a 10, 15 minute retrospective on the career of Lyndon LaRouche. But I got to say, ever since we recorded that episode, we've been contacted by various sources who have sent us sort of missives and feelers about setting up this interview. It's an odd one. It's unexpected, but I'm pleased to say that we now have Lyndon LaRouche on the phone. Lyndon, are you there? Uh, indeed, we are here. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for reaching out, of course. Uh, and we are tuned to the correct tuning uh, for this interview, which is a tune of the note of A uh, equals 432 hertz. Lyndon, I got to say this is uh, a bit odd for me because, you know, we brought you up on the show because we thought you were dead. So, I'm, I mean, how, how are you alive? This was addressed clearly in a memorandum to the president uh, in 1977, a memo uh, that was both uh, telefaxed and also printed uh, for backup copy. And it was distributed to President Reagan and members of the State Department. Uh, what we knew then uh, through our contacts, our intelligence contacts with the National Caucus of Labor Committees, uh, is that the entire regime of uh, the establishment uh, on both sides of the Atlantic was a project of the British royal family, which itself is uh, invested heavily in the propagation of uh, a number of Reichstag fire events in order to uh, distract uh, from the necessity of the uh, primacy of uh, advancement of the physical economy. And this is clear. This is not only clear, this is clear and true. This is true, and this is clear. And uh, we have evidence also that uh, Henry Kissinger is homosexual. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lewis, though, I mean, it, it doesn't quite answer my question. Uh, you know, it was re widely reported in the media oh, that you now, had passed facts. away. These are facts, of course. If you have a problem with that, then you have a problem with facts. Continue, continue. <laughs> But uh, Mr. LaRouche, though, why has it been reported that, that you died this week? We are clearly looking at a Reichstag fire event. And this Reichstag fire event comes straight from Queen Elizabeth and uh, her cohort, Prince Philip, who, of course, we all know uh, are KGB assets <laughs> going back to the Reichstag fire. Uh, and we know, of course, that Hitler himself. Uh, when he uh, uh, when he manipulated the events of the Reichstag fire of 1933, was acting in accordance with the KGB in order to set himself up as an asset for itself to be taken down, ultimately culminating in the Kabuki event of the Battle of Stalingrad. <laughs> That's true. That's true, and I know it because I was active. I was active. Uh, as a pacifist during World War II in that theater of conflict. So I, that, that to me, that's, that's personal knowledge. That's the back of my hand. That's the garden and the bottom of my flower. It's funny, uh, in, in last week and then the same week that I suppose it was erroneously reported that you had uh, passed away at the age of 97, uh, it was also reported that California has finally scrapped their long, uh, long planned uh, plan to have high-speed rail um, in the central corridor of California. Uh, as a longtime proponent of high-speed rail, what do you make of that? There is a media reporting the death of so-and-so, the figure within the new Federalist Schiller Institute and so <laughs> forth, uh, and at the same time, concomitantly, as part of the same intelligence operation going back all the way to the KGB, which is still operative, on orders of Leonid Brezhnev, which have never been countermanded, orders to sabotage the very uh, uh, land bridge rail project that would that uh, the high speed rail project in California would have been an integral integral part of had we been able to steer it and sabotage it in certain ways. That is the kind of movement that will build a new Bretton Woods, and I know this because I have my economics background. I have a background in economics, and that's why I say new Bretton Woods is the way to reinvest in a physical economy while accelerating global warming, which is necessary to prevent uh, the kind of uh, major population reduction that uh, the KGB, Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth Texas would have uh, on this planet, if it is in fact a planet. <laughs> The, the Snowpiercer Global 
high speed rail network taking a hit this week. Snowpiercer was was uh, partly funded uh, with funds from the National Caucus of Labor Committees. That was a uh, that was something that uh, the LaRouche Network was proud to get behind, and we invested heavily, heavily in that project to try to popularize a land bridge. Uh, that would go at high speed in a global cooling scenario, the opposite of what we are being told, a global cooling scenario. We invested as much as we could. We saw every matinee that was available in New Hampshire uh, for the two weeks that it was in the movie theaters. That kind of investment is real physical economy, and that's the kind of investment matinee tickets and early evening tickets, because obviously we have to go to bed at a certain time, but early evening tickets are very important when you're making a massive global investment from the LaRouche Network into a, a, into a, a, a counter-propaganda project as important as vital, as vital to, to uh, countering the KGB propaganda as Snowpiercer was. I will also point out to you uh, that uh, the movie Snowpiercer, uh, due to our agitation and due to uh, some of our funding and uh, behind-the-scenes manipulation, was tuned correctly to the Verdi tuning of the 1840s. <laughs> it is proper for the playing of all classical music, and also it is the proper tuning for any soundtrack in any motion picture. You'll notice my voice has been tuned to the original Giuseppe Verdi tuning, which is to say A is equals 432 hertz. A, a demonstration. Uh, allow me to demonstrate the Verdi scale for you, if you're not familiar. Uh, it, 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 the, the notes become lower. So what would sound to someone propagandized by KGB musicology into saying that it was a flat note is actually the way that Giuseppe Verdi intended his music to sound. So the famous Brindisi drinking song from La Traviata is intended to sound like blah, 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 blah. That is the music. That is the melodious music of Giuseppe Verdi in the 1800s. We, which in a pioneering documentary, uh, which has yet to be released, we uh, conclusively prove that Verdi, in what was known to us as the 1800s or the 19th century, actually took place in the 1700s or the 21st century. <laughs> Well, it was uh, all Mr. clearly laid out in a memorandum that I screamed over the White House gates to President Gerald Ford. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mr. LaRouche, uh, I'm, again, still not quite sure whether you are alive, faked your own death, or coming to us from beyond the grave. <laughs> Living with LaRouche, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> All right, here we are, everybody. It's me, Matt, and Felix, but we got a special guest sitting in with us today. It's Lyle Jeremy Rubin, and he's here to talk about boot. As we've said over the last couple shows, the last couple of weeks, uh, the boot levels <laughs> are, are, have become just dangerously high. The containment wall has been breached. Uh, boot is just getting it's everywhere. Getting everywhere. It's getting into the ocean. And uh, Lyle, you wrote a review of Max's latest book, The Corrosion of Conservatism in the Baffler. Uh, and I read the piece and I really loved it. And I wanted to have you on as someone who's actually read this book. Uh, usually I'm doing the, the hard work of reading just an op-ed that you wouldn't touch with, you know, in a stage four biohazard suit. But you've, you've read Max Boots, The Corrosion of Conservatism, and reviewed it in The Baffler. So you've exposed yourself to a great deal of boot. Yeah, it was painful, more painful than a boot camp or, you know, pretty much they anything else. After uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you begin the review uh, by uh, discussing in sort of uh, slang the difference between a boot and a salt. And you uh, sort of carry that throughout the review. So what's a boot and what's a salt? So um, a salt, usually it's in reference to uh, Marines that have been in for a while, salt, salty staff sergeants, sure. sergeants, sergeants, stuff like that. So originally it meant um, Marines that had been out on, on, at sea for a long time. You know, they collected a lot of salt. So these are people that have been in combat or just been in the Corps for a long time. They, they know what's really up. They're, they're disillusioned with all the kind of like bullshit mythologies that tend to go along with the Marine Corps and with like America in general. And then you've got boots, and these are people straight out of boot camp. 
Um, and these are folks that, you know, still are very gung-ho and rah-rah and kind of believe everything their uh, drill instructors told them. Um, so, you know, I definitely put uh, Max Boot in the, the latter column. And, you know, they, they believe that, you know, sincerely that this is my rifle, this is my gun, one's for fighting, the other's for fun. You know, you have to, you have to lose that illusion after a while. And, uh, you know, and, and change the name of the, from a girl to maybe something else. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm just like, what is, Ma- like, this, is, this was his big, like, book that was like, you know, I'm breaking with the right. And now he's become, like, you know, a prominent critic of, uh, you know, Donald Trump. And, you know, what he regards as kind of Yahoo conservatism. But, like, in this book, what actually is his case against the right or conservatism? Yeah, I think, I don't think there's much of a case there. I think it's mostly kind of public relations uh, at the end of the day. I mean, he, he, he generally agrees with the kind of fundamentals of, of the Trumpist policy across the board. You know, you can pick anything, whether it's immigration, whether it's tax cuts for the rich, uh, whether it's, um, you know, intervening in Venezuela. Um, you could go on and on. I, I think he, he generally agrees with, with the Trump platform. To be honest with you, I, I think it's more of a career move uh, than anything else. Now, I mean, he'll, he would claim and, and his defenders would claim that uh, he's an anti-racist, right? Like Trump and, and the Republican Party has been taken over by racists. And, and that was kind of the breaking point for, for the neocons, uh, including Boot. But, uh, you know, I mean, the fact that the other day he, he used, uh, you know, the genocide of, uh, you know, the Indians as, as kind of the model moving forward. I don't think he really ever departed from uh, any kind of like racist you know, Republican past. But I mean, he has he has said and, and what to what extent has he said that the Iraq war was like a mistake? And on what terms does he make that claim? You know, he never really does. OK, yeah, he really it's, it's pretty shocking, actually. Um, he, he goes on. It's really it was actually a lot worse than I thought it would be because I read a lot of reviews and I just assumed he was at least going to play the part of a of a contrite, you know, repentant, uh, you know, former supporter of the Iraq war. But he really didn't. He went on for like five pages explaining that he was just in support of it, what everyone else was in support of. And, and uh, you know, he went on in that vein. And then he eventually just said, you know, it was a mistake. And he never really explained why. Like, I guess it, they, we never brought democracy there like he thought we would bring democracy <laughs> there. left it on the bus. Damn yeah. it. Yeah. But it was... Um, Reading from your review now, you, you write here, uh, the bootness of Max Boot and the bootness of his memoir in particular, a book that purports to have abandoned the exact bootness it embodies, reflects the overriding bootness of the military industrial media complex that is so lavishly rewarded talking heads like Boot. The contradiction between Boot's affected saltiness and his actual bootness marks the principal, if unwitting, drama of the corrosion of conservatism. It also happens to epitomize one of the stubborn absurdities of our time, namely an inane but lethal ruling class lecturing us with one side of their mouth that Trumpism signals the worst chauvinist America, and with the other telling us that we must resurrect the chauvinist status quo that brought us Trumpism in the first place. So that, that, this is basically the... the He's saying uh, Trump is an outlier and, you know, he's this horrible aberration. But what we really need to return to is um, what America was like 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, and this is this has been the line since uh, Trump Trump assumed the Oval Office. Right. I mean, it's it's pretty I mean, this whole world we live in is just so shocking, but it somehow managed to get like even more shocking the past two years in my mind. Like, yeah, I mean, the answer to Trumpism, you know, from MSNBC and and, and a good part of the liberal uh pundit class is um to return to everything that brought us trumpism and it, it really doesn't uh you know i don't think i'm exaggerating when i say that i mean they, they literally made like the the entire lineup of msnbc now like everyone like in the bush administration <laughs> i mean um, msnbc i mean cable news in general but especially msnbc is like this utterly dull uh sort of life force sapping version of pro wrestling and Max Boot is his character now is that he is, you know, he's a weary but principled traveler. He's Barristan and Selmy. He's left the he's left King's Landing, but it's so funny that he 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 affects this attitude like he's I've seen it all. Now I'm going to fight back, and it's like all you've done this entire time is write articles that five thousand <laughs> asexuals in Manhattan read, and it just. It's all pointless. All these people lead utterly pointless lives. No one will remember any of this in 
you know, five years, much less a generation. It's just complete crap in the face of the existential crises we face, everything that they do. But Boot especially, he's a pointless person. I mean, we all love to yell at him because he just... He has that wretched kidney bean head <laughs> and he wears those repulsive fucking hats. But he, yeah, and he looks like, yeah, some sort of detective who, uh, re- who recreationally takes chemotherapy. <laughs> but uh, he is an utterly, you could make an AI that writes Max Boot columns. But he just, they need to have him on and they need to have all these people on and they need to have this. They don't even remember their own lives. Rachel Maddow doesn't remember her own book she wrote in 2013. None of these people remember what animated them during the Bush years because they have now believed themselves that they they have now tricked themselves into thinking that they felt normal then when they did not. You never feel normal. You never feel happy. Neither of those are a state of being that is permanent or manageable. It's never a baseline unless you're one of the people who makes posts on Facebook that's like, we thins are freaking addicting, <laughs> but you're not. And I think one of the things Trump did is he absolutely destroyed our concept of past because we want to feel anything but what we feel now. But he also completely destroyed our version of the, fu- our, our idea of the future. The never ending cycle since about 2015 of like, this is, he's going to get taken down now, yeah. now, now. And we all know now that it's never going to be the easy thing. It's never going to be the one shot that takes it. Parody, not shot in that way. <laughs> it's not going to be the thing that takes him out. Uh, and we know we're condemned to every week there's going to be a four-day cycle where he's like, let's get rid of Zimbabwe. <laughs> and then, you know, the principal conservatives condemn him and the libs are like, George W. Bush would never say this. And then people are like, oh, there are conflicting reports. He He actually said... Let's get rid of this, you know, the Zimbabwe ambassador. He was rude to me. <laughs> and so it's different. And then there's just a counter cycle and it's the same thing. And absolutely nothing happens. And because we have no concept of the future, we can only go back to this false past. We have to go back. We have to pretend that like 2006, 2007, it was these years of common consensus between uh, regular liberals and neocons. And not just that it felt pretty much as bad as now the world felt like it was falling apart just as much. The bottom felt like it was falling out because it was. It created the necessary conditions for this now. And before that, like there was some common cause, not just conservatives completely beating the shit out of liberals in every arena of public life. And so now uh, we're just condemned to live in a false past of the late 2000s, but not even the good kind. No Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> no, you know, when Justin Timberlake would wear an express vest and... <laughs> make a song with the game (laughs) none of the fun stuff no chrysler 300s no going to take your best gal to see the interpreter with nicole kitman and drinking a coke zero which had just come out no pretend no thinking the crash was a good movie being that stupid none of that none of that you keep bringing up the interpreter i don't i forget the the most 2005 movie movie ever made movie was it's the most it's the most and sean penn People are going to look back at the interpreter I'm, as an I, era defining film. This is a rare movie film. that you've seen that I haven't. Guess what? I've only seen half of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the most, it, it's like if, you know, when I have kids and they ask me the inevitable question, everyone's going to get, what was 2005 like? We're going to sit in my home theater that's made to look like the backseat of a Chrysler 300. <laughs> we're going to drink Coke Zero and we're going to watch the interpreter and I'll be like, now you get it. <laughs> But yeah, no. Uh, my point is that we love it. We love to see all this. <laughs> we love to see. I think, it. I think I feel like a broader point is that there does seem like with Max Boot being a perfect example, this like sort of eternal reoccurrence of the Bush era neocons. All the people who sold us the Iraq War, bafflingly, are never going away. And as you describe in this in this review, are beginning to find common cause and form alliances with yeah, like the liberal media and Democratic politicians. Right. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, um, the kind of liberal center of the Democratic Party is using the neocons to kind of push back against the left insurgents. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of what's going on. Um, They see a a common ally. I mean, they're both anti-left. They both want to, you know, maintain the basic capitalist imperialist order. And uh, I think, if anything, the, the kind of neocon craze is a sign of of the of the kind of insurgent power of a new left. 
uh, that, that they're willing to be so out and open about, you know, being allies with people like Bill Crystal and, and Max Boot. Right. Um, you know, Max Boot, like, uh, his books before this one, like he fancies himself, he was like a sort of a an expert on the history and practice of counterinsurgency and small wars. Well, you wrote blogs. <laughs> I'm an ex. I consider myself an expert in uh, mechanized warfare. <laughs> it's a very uh, vintage blog post I had from 2005 when several 19 year olds from Indiana were getting blown up by Radio Shack equipment <laughs> that literally affected absolutely nothing. Wait. And George Bush coined the nickname for me. Hat beans. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's talking about. Uh, he writes in his book. Uh, he's very impressed about uh, you know the times he embedded with the troops and like you know came under fire in a convoy yeah. or whatever. Uh, the you know I've disclosed this before on the show, but I'll do it again. Uh, my Max Boot connection, uh, dear reader, it was one of the first uh, jobs I had in my former career at Live Right. No smoke to the good people at uh, WW Norton uh, Live Right. But uh, essentially, I, too, am also slightly responsible for war crimes by being the editorial assistant on his history of counterinsurgency, Invisible Armies. And cool, dude. The first time I ever met him, yes, fr friends and listeners, he was wearing that hat. <laughs> I was can, it cocked at a rakish angle? Yeah, absolutely. That, dude, that's how bad Max Boot wants to live in 2006. He's dressing like prime Justin Timberlake. <laughs> He but, wants to have so bad. Yeah, that, that yeah that book uh, begins the description of you know going out on patrol in Iraq and um, you know sort of uh, he was very uh, he, he had a, a lot of rapturous detail about you know sitting on your helmet so you don't get your balls and dick blown off <laughs> by an IED and he you know loved General Petraeus that was like oh, the whole course. book was just basically essentially that guy has read several he, books he, he begins with like you know from the Maccabees up until it like gets you to the point where he's just like Petraeus has the answer so like. Have you ever read any of his stuff? Like, what do you make of his like theory of small wars and counterinsurgencies? I'm just a small bean doing a small <laughs> war. Well, ah, to, you're so tiny. Honest, I'm I mad. Haven't, I haven't. You know, yeah, I, yeah, I could only like waste so much time yeah. in my life, so I, I haven't read much of of the other boot books. But I read a lot of his columns through the years, and like, I mean, my own personal history. Like, I was on the right. Like, yeah. that's how I ended up in the Marine Corps in the first place. So, like, I read a lot of his columns back in the day. And, you told and, me you didn't join the Marines to change it from the inside? <laughs> yeah, I, I had my reasons. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, I, I was a true... I really... I mean, in some ways, I feel like, you know, one of the reasons Boot pisses me off so much is, like, I kind of was that, but I, uh -huh. was that at, I was that at, like, the age of 19, you know, and then you grow up. And, like, that guy just never... That motherfucker never grows up. <laughs> or, like, or, he just makes a shit ton of money and, and is, like, famous. And, like, everyone tells, like, tells him he's great because, like... You, you have know, two choices. You can grow up like a nerd or you can take a hot glue gun and just fucking put that fucking hat on your head so it can never come off. That's, that's what I love about War College. As you keep getting older and the kids in Iraq just keep getting... <laughs> The kids in comic ping pong. <laughs> they stay uh, the same age. What? Nobody the, the likes one, you. Nobody likes you when you look like me. What's my <laughs> age again? What's my the, age again? The one thing I will say about Boot, though, he he's an impressive guy in the sense that like he's never accomplished anything. <laughs> he's been wrong about everything. Um, it's amazing how many his of those face guys are. is just like repulsive in every way, <laughs> and yet he's managed to get where he got. Like that 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 requires some kind of talent. Like it's intangible. I don't know exactly know how to like describe it, but you know, mad props to him for for that accomplishment. He seems like I mean, his personality type is like from like fourth grade on. They're like Max, you're amazing at worksheets. <laughs> he's like, that's right, I am. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. He's just done the worksheets of life. <laughs> He's written all the right blogs and shitty books at the right time for, you know, not a massive amount of people, but the right people to go, wow, this from Max is great. Um, you, you quote one part of the book. This is Max Boots writing now. And I, I love I love this part. He, he's writing about um, how uh, Trump's um, uh, you know, violation of norms sort of uh, freed him to sort of do the same and. Uh, attack a president in the way he wouldn't normally consider because he writes here and introduce a third <laughs> i was influenced by watching old black and white movies from the 50s in which the chief executive was such a mighty personage personage that he could only be glimpsed in silhouette or from the back seeing his face would have seemed as sacrilegious as glimpsing the face of god okay settle down <laughs> okay well does he know like the truth about movies in the 50s that the president was always just a silhouette of orson welles and he just he always had he always had sauce on his face. 
So they had to film in shadows. And he says, I had some trepidation about calling out a presidential candidate and a Republican to boot in terms, there's that word again, in terms <laughs> normally reserved for foreign tyrants, but my indignation propelled me forward. I could not stay silent. And as you, of course, point out after this, um, he he had no such compunction about describing John Kerry as like appeasing terrorists or whatever. I mean, also, right. like, I, I love the like, I could not stay silent. Just pure numbers. How many votes do you think were affected by that? <laughs> not staying silent. Pure numbers. Uh, five. Exactly. In, in the boot yeah. family. <laughs> well, so there's another thing about that that passage. I actually had a whole other section just talking about the writing style of the book, which I got left on the cutting room floor. But like, there's a certain aesthetic that comes with this kind of centrist politics. Like, it's not just that they have really shitty, in fact, like absolutely reprehensible views and politics. It's like their style is just so juvenile and and so like like he says, like they're just stuck in this like you know ten year old watching like old black and white movies moment, and they can never escape that. And, uh, you know, he talks at one point, he talks about how um, he, he was regretting one other book. He, I, I, I think it was his first, first book ever. He regrets that Savage one. Savage Wars loved, of Peace. Yeah, I think you know, it was even called. before oh, that. Okay. It was like some other book that no one knows about. That He loves all his other books, but his first book he, he <laughs> hated. Invisible Army. He feels bad about. <laughs> and like the, the metaphors he uses are just hilarious. Like he says, like, I feel like an, a porn actress like a former porn actress that now is ashamed of their porn videos. I'll blow me, <laughs> yeah. blow me yeah. max. Yeah. A fucking porn actress is so much more talented <laughs> yeah. and an accomplished person than Max Boot. At least fucking people look at their work. Or the their only faces. people you're the only people that like read this are people like you who had to you know you you wrote an article about how shit it was and like the last living vampire who lives in Northern Virginia. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. Great. Like, like oh, God. I, I, a porn actress who's, is that part of his fantasy? Who's ashamed of her work? You know, when she meets a nice, you know, former neocon pundit now, voice of reason, <laughs> and, and, you know, she sees past his old age and you can maybe teach her a few things and she can show him a few things. And, you know, it starts out, he goes like, I've had a hard life. People took over my entire political party. Could I please just get access to your private Snapchat? And she's like, yes. And she, one day she just saunters up to him and puts on his hat and goes, you know, I see an invisible army down there. And then we kiss. And then Donald Donald Trump is like, ah, fake news. And then he gets he gets owned by the by the ghost of uh John Bedort's grandfather. And everyone cheers for me. Uh Nuriel Maliki apologizes to me for ruining my plan. Cool, Max. Uh yeah, no, I mean like uh, talking about Max's post porn career. He hasn't done anything halfway as good as Tracy Lord's appearances in John Waters movies or the original Blade starring Wesley Snipes and Stephen Dorff. That's true. Every every woman I know who's like has like yeah, private Snapchat is like been is like a significantly smarter person than Max Boat. That just fucking uh He's so that's such an old guy thing to say. I feel like I'm in a freaking porn. <laughs> he actually cool. said, and, I, and I'm now remembering, he actually said porno film. <laughs> Mac, yeah. Max that Mood, is the funniest Mac, way to say Mac, it, so props yeah. to him on that. Max Mood <laughs> jacks off by like typing bing.com into his notes app, copy and pasting it into his browser, and then typing in porno and clicking on images. <laughs> He's like, hell yeah. Let's go, dude. By, by the way, one more thing. He, he actually said at one point that after Trump won, he was drinking scotch or something. He was drinking something, but he had also taken like Tylenol that day. So you he was like, I know you're not supposed to mix like <laughs> Tylenol with alcohol. Tylenol? It was, it, I don't know. He had taken like something lame. Like it was like, oh yeah, it was like something God. like Tylenol. And it was, it was, I swear, it's like this the entire way through. Amstel. Like, it's actually the only thing that got me through the book because yo, it was, it was funny. Yo, like, I'm on that Amstel light and Flintstone vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> Trump's got me being the real me. I'm pouring up in public. <laughs> Damn, I'm <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> yo, do yo, Donald Trump, I swear to God, if you tweet again, I'm gonna take half this bottle of St. John's wort and kombucha. <laughs> My body's on your hands, sir. Uh here, here are some other uh some of the uh some some of the, the, the drivel in his book. Uh you know, again, for for all his, uh, you know, sort of um, conversion, he uh, speaks glowingly about Hillary Clinton being a, a politician admirably free from political cant. And then he says in private because, you know, he can't quite breach that chasm yeah. of uh, uh, what Hillary Clinton is actually like. But uh, but, you know, he goes on to talk about, you know, Obama was still too. 
he was, Obama was too non-interventionist, conspicuously leaving out, as you say, Libya, Afghanistan, Yemen, and our drone war in Africa. And the, I don't know, everywhere else on the planet, apparently. that That's still not enough for him. And uh, he also goes on to say, uh, John McCain was one of the greatest American war heroes. Uh, wow. And Ronald, and then, that's, he's one of the best. What a bunch of fucking bots. <laughs> <laughs> we have no one good then. Uh, he said uh, the, the whole nation was, of course, uh, touched and uplifted by Reagan's speech about the Challenger explosion. Like, this is just a, a greatest hits here. And then my favorite, he says, uh, we have to be concerned about demagogues who are preying on the fears of their constituents and villain, vilifying minorities such as the rich. <laughs> Yeah, he really said that. I just want to make sure yeah. everyone. Oh, yeah, no. this is a quote. Yeah, man, that's a real high level of boot right there. Oh my god, the, the, the Geiger counters are going off. The boot is overflowing in the glass right now. But I, I want to read you the paragraph that you you, you list this uh, some some good uh, some good hyperlinks to some some greatest hits here. And you, you write, uh, I really like this paragraph. Uh, you write. What's most revealing about this capsule of neoconservative bromides, all of which dissipate after the slightest contact with reality, spend some time with those links if you don't believe me, is that they now pass just as well as liberal bromides. It's become a bipartisan affair to praise men who have devoted their lives to the violent redistribution of wealth and power upwards and to run interference for the capitalist empire or in boot parlance, the rules-based international order that allowed them to do so. The great conceit is that this is that this alliance between the left and right is merely strategic, as the recent partnering letter of veteran NBC MSNBC reporter William Arkin attests. What we're actually seeing is a long simmering ideological romance coming out of the shadows. In Arkin's word, NBC and other supposedly liberal media outlets have begun emulating the national security state, busy and profitable. And like that's you know that that sort of speaks to why Boot maintain you know went from being the hardcore defender and promoter of the Iraq war to now someone in good standing on MSNBC. And as like we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, it, this is sort of revealing like all the people who were on the liberal side of the foreign policy question during the Bush years who were like against the Iraq war, the Iraq war or against it in so much as they thought it was poorly executed and, and not the fact that it was you know morally that wrong. That was the bravest position. Yeah. Uh, we're are really basically just closet neocons themselves. Yeah, I think this is a real kabuki dance that goes on. I think I, I really like the scene with um with with Boot and Clinton at the Council of Foreign Relations, like you know, ch uh, you know, cozying up behind the scenes because I think that really speaks to the nature of the foreign policy establishment. Yeah, I think they put on a show. You know, to, they're not putting on a show anymore. It's it's clear that they agree on foreign policy, but for a while they were putting on a show that they had these major disagreements. And I, you know, I think that this moment is really useful. I think, I think we're going to see, I, I think I'm actually somewhat hopeful that there's going to be a little, we haven't seen it yet, but I think we will start seeing some pushback on our foreign policy in part because of what we've seen for the past two years, that there's just, the space is, is open, wide open. I, I know we've talked about this a couple times now, but every time we get done recording, something happens that's so dumbfounding that, you know, I have to, to bring it up now. You talk about, you know, sort of teachable moments. For me, it was this week, literally right after we got done recording the episode about Ilan Omar and her uh, grilling of Elliot Abrams in front of Congress, I saw uh, a tweet from the VP of the Center for American Progress, Kelly Magsman, that essentially said, um, let's not caricature Elliot Abrams. Like, I, I know him as like a d decent man and a good mentor. And like, yes, he's made mistakes. But like, Literally just saying like, hey, like, let's slow. Whoa, slow down. Let's not call he, calling him a war criminal. And it's just like, first of all, you're at the center for American progress and you're finding a way to, I don't know, say Elliot Abrams is a decent human being. He works for the Trump administration. You can't even have the fig leaf of he's one of the good neocons who's seen the light and is now on yeah. our side. He's working for the Putin's puppet or whatever the fuck you think it is. And then she went on to say, we share goals in Venezuela. Which Ooh, is like, that's, that's, that's reassuring if yeah, you're a Venezuelan. Well, here. both of them want it. I mean, how oh, they, bad? They want and it. it was like, she did it. And then there was this guy, Nicholas Burns, like a whole bunch of like uh, DC foreign policy hands and good standing on the liberal democratic side just came out to say, this is too much. It's gone too far. Yes, he's made mistakes, but he's a good man. And, you know, we shouldn't, you know, let's not tear people down was one of them. And I'm like, if you can't, if you can't get on board with we need to tear down Elliot Abrams and like what fucking use are you? And that's what you're saying about like a teachable moment. Like 
I'm glad all of these people have revealed themselves as morally cretinous at best and like absolute monsters at worst. And it was just, it, I know it shouldn't shock me, but I was genuinely gobsmacked by like, are these people unaware of what happened in Central America in the 80s or do they just not connect it to the guy who they know personally? So, yeah, we were talking about this a little before the recording, but, um, you know, I thought about this a long time and I kind of talk about it a little bit in the piece. But, you know, I think there are some real hacks and shills that are just doing it for the money and the power. But these aren't the people that we know. Like these these aren't people that hang out on Twitter all day arguing with people. Yeah, they're they're not, um, you know, they're not they don't they're kind of behind the scenes. They show up on MSNBC and CNN as like consultants or, you know, I'm thinking of, um like the Podesta dynasty, people like that. Like, you know, I think that, that, you know, it's all about the money and the power. But I think what's interesting about the blob is like the face of the blob, the foreign policy blob, are, are they're true believers. I mean, this mm -hmm. is why I did this piece on Boot. Like, it's not just about Boot. Like, Boot, yeah, no, he's, he's, just like he's, he's the best of them. Yeah. He is the, he's the goat of Boots. <laughs> and, um, but I think, I think what's made them effective for a very long time is they actually believe their own bullshit. And I think, you know, and, you know, at this point, it's just like it's gotten they've reached the kind of peak, peak bullshit moment. And I think I think there's going to be some pushback. But, um, you know, if they were just hacks or shills, I don't think they would have made it this far. Well, like she, she the, the Kelly Magsman or whatever, she deleted the tweet because she was like, you know, I'm sorry that a lot of people interpreted this that like I was, you know, defending uh, atrocities that happened. But like, you know, you know, I'll try to do better. And it's just like so you're aware of like these things happened. Right, but, but you don't think, and like she said, like yes, he's made mistakes, and they've all said, oh, he made mistakes, but like they, it was very clear that they were all talking about his mistake was lying to Congress. Like the, the mistake is not the actual genocides that. Well, he, that's the like, thing. They he, they think that's going to happen. That's just part of the, the the machinery that we're all you know slaves to. Basically, that's that's part and parcel of of imperial management. Is there's going to be some massacres. He was a guy in a room whose job it was to massage the massacres, make the massacres palatable, make sure they didn't cause too much trouble, didn't cause too much of a a, a pushback against the the program. In their minds, that has nothing to do with the, the actual machinery of of violence. They they think that it's a totally separate uh, uh, role uh, uh, as as this person in this air conditioned room uh, whose job it is to make us okay with what we have to do. So, you know, he's not an agent in their mind. He's not an agent of violence. He is a person who is dealt a hand. Oh, like his first day on the job. Oh, yeah, they massacred 800 people in El Salvador. Well, boy, got to roll up my sleeves. That's how they see it. They don't see him as having any kind of connection, any kind of criminal relationship to actual murder. Yeah, I mean, it just reminds me of my time. I was in Afghanistan for a year when I was in the Marines. And, you know, it was interesting. You go to the front lines and people... No, no one believed in the mission of the, you know, the mission at all. I mean, in the front lines, you were just protecting yourself and you were protecting those to your left and your right. And then I'd go to the big bases where all the colonels and generals were and, and the staff officers. And a lot of them believed it. And, you know, it was a very simple logic. It was, a, it was a boot logic where it was like, you know, yeah, sure, we're doing some bad things. You know, I'd report back and talk about some of the things I saw. And they'd be like, yeah, we're doing bad things, but the Taliban's worse. You know, and that that's that's really what it comes down to is these people believe it's either the Taliban or whatever, whoever the hell the new Hitler is at any moment mm -hmm. or it's us. And we're we're not Hitler. Yeah. We're not the we're Taliban. Like, yeah, we are like by definition, the good guys because, yes. you know, World War Two or whatever. But yeah, it's like uh, for someone like Elliot Abrams and his like the people who are his actual defenders, not like people who are just like, oh, he was nice to me at a party or I, I worked with him one time and he, he's not a he's not a monster. Like for the people who like actually defended like Reagan, our, our government's policy towards Central America, they're like, oh, like for them, the specter is always like, you know, totalitarian communism and the horrors of the gulags or the cultural revolution. They're like, so obviously we got to get our hands dirty, prevent some greater evil from happening. But it's just like, um, once you're bayoneting babies, it's just like, what greater evil are you really trying to prevent? <laughs> like, like what's like, what if we just didn't do that? Like, what would be something worse than that that would happen? Nationalizing unused uh, banana fields. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, yeah, that's the actual answer. Yeah. But and I, I was just like thinking about it this week, like th this Elliot Abrams moment was just just been fascinating to me, like that people are still willing to defend this guy. And what's interesting to me is like, in the consensus of like politics, like things that are been removed from the realm of ideology that are just considered objectively true. Like 
about America's conduct in its own borders within our own history. Like it's unideological to be like slavery was an atrocity, horrible. And then like after that, the history of reconstruction and Jim Crow, that's evil and bad. But everything outside of our borders in terms of our foreign policy, it's like there's just this giant, it's not just politics ends at the like the water's edge. It's like your consciousness does. There's this, just this giant wall specifically about like America's role in the Cold War that like even though you're aware of evil bad things happening, it's like never connected. It just exists in a different moral universe and it's never like, oh, we're, oh, we're the bad guys actually. Right, because it's they they see it as as necessary, like we were saying. They they see that this was an existential conflict and anything you had to do was not required by the moment you're not making a moral choice like there's no there's no agency you're not deciding to do a coup in a uh, chile or something you're not deciding to you know back psychotic murders in angola or something you are reacting to the enemy and your victory is the victory for humanity and so anything that you have to do to win that war it's 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 not morality can enter into it because you're not making choices you are doing the only thing you have to do in that moment yeah i'd say the difference here between you know the neocon and these people uh the neocon they are a true believer but a true believer in the sense that this is a choice but we must do it because it gives us meaning and because it either if they're depending on what shade of true believer they are it either gives us meaning or it you know it it makes money for someone who pays me to write uh sixth grade cal caliber essays for you know the foundation of liberty and defense of democracy voting uh egalitarian blah 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 but for this the the other side the sort of like more uh liberal natsec person they just they're an unwitting Strassian. they just they genuinely believe they're in a battle between good and evil that they cannot, there's no choice. None, yeah. none. You have to be in it. It has to be accepted on face value that we have to be everywhere. We have to have bases in every country that we have to have, uh, we have to have a horse in every race of every fucking leader of every fucking country in the world of every natural resource, because if we don't get it, someone else will, and if they get it, not us, well, look out. It's, uh, equally pointless lives. But, you know, the MSNBC person, they just, they really do think they're in Game, game of War Fire Age, you know? <laughs> but, like, if, if you're, yeah, if you're in the blob, like, no matter what side you're on in the blob, it's just, like, essentially, the language is always in terms of, like, well, these are our national interests and strategic and, you know, nudging. Or whether you're, either if you're a liberal, you want to nudge countries in the right direction. And if you're conservative, you want to, you know, force them to do it. But it's all backed up with american military violence and power so it's never in the language of oh here are the the children we shot into mass graves in central america it's like the samantha power thing that she can write an entire book about a problem from hell genocide in the american state and not mention indonesia or central mm. america or guatemala even once yeah. in the fucking book and then she can go to fucking yankee games with henry kissinger and like clap him on the back it's like again she's not stupid it's like she's presumably aware that all this shit happened and it's not like a denialist or anything it's just like there's no connection it just it doesn't link up in her mind yeah which is just it's so perverse and fascinating to me yeah it's it's very much i, mean, I think it, re it really is kind of same as it ever was i mean you mentioned slavery a little yeah. earlier and I, I think you know if you look at the arguments these people make it's not that different than the apologists the northern apologists for slavery you know mm -hmm. decades before the actual civil war you know, it's the same shit where you say, you know, it's always been this way. We've always had slavery. Or, or you say, you know, our own way of life is dependent on this. It's regrettable. But until we can find a way to get out of this, we kind of have to tolerate it. Um, you know, this whole idea of the state of exception. Like, you know, in the North, we can, we can have some, some form of, of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, but the South is kind of a state of exception. And this is kind of the same thinking when it comes to empire today, is that there's these states of exception beyond America's borders, or even within America's, you know, there's, you know, I mean, Baltimore. I mean, there's all sorts of places where I think there's states of exception where basically anything's game. Um, but you say that that's just, that's necessary for right now. And maybe eventually we can get beyond this. What, like, what do you make of the fact that now you have p figures on the right and I'm thinking of Tucker Carlson specifically, who wrote an op-ed this week saying, flat out, 
why are, are people like Max Boot and Bill Crystal still around? Like, why why are they still in the media? These people have been wrong about everything, and it's just like that's a hundred percent right. But like, I'm it, it's very dangerous that like t- someone like Tucker Carlson is making that argument, not because the Tucker Carlson himself is inherently. Uh, like he sucks, but he's not like a danger in and of itself. It's only dangerous because there is literally no, almost nobody representing the liberal or democratic side who would make that argument in public. Yeah, and, it's, and like from places like Cap, you're hearing, oh, actually, like no, they're good, and we should ally with them because they have important things to well, say. Well, not they should be in a fucking cage. Oh, for the rest totally. Of their life. And, and yeah. like one of the going back to the slavery thing. I mean, one of the leading anti-imperialists in the early 19th century was uh, Calhoun. Yeah. You know, it was it was the slave math. You know, the the pro-slavery guy. And the reason he was, you know, anti-imperialist is he knew that empire led led to uh, waste, waste mixing. <laughs> it would it would end up bringing, uh, you know, non-white peoples into into our borders. Um, and I think I think that's really what's kind of driving people like Carlson and a lot of the other anti-imperialists on the right. Not all of them. I wouldn't say all of them, but a good chunk of them. You know, they 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 they're smart enough to realize that empire. You know, if you if you're against, uh, you know, influxes of Im- immigrants, if you're if you're against from countries um, like El Salvador, right, or Honduras, right, yeah, right, I wonder why right, they're coming to America. Right, right. Yeah. If, you know, I mean, the majority of our immigration immigrant populations come from all the places that we've warred in. Um, so I think that's really the logic on that. I mean, right. you know, and as far as Tucker Carlson goes, like he was 100 yeah. percent pro Iraq War until I don't know a month ago, well, well, and not just yeah. that, but he was a guy who like on would go on cable TV and be like. If you criticize George W. Bush or the war on terrorism, you'd be like, oh, it sounds like you like Saddam and Osama bin. Like, do you do you like terrorism? Do you want more 9-11s to happen? So I mean, like, he's an utterly shameless person, but you know, we should take note of the fact that it is, yes, it actually is dangerous that like he is if if he if fucking if we let Tucker Carlson become a prominent voice against neo, the neoconservative like imperialist vision or even like the liberal foreign policy world order, like that's fucking dangerous. Yeah. Because like if if no one who's been who's actually right and has a actual real moral case to make against empire uh, that is you know not completely cynical and self serving, then uh, you guess what like it's pot like it, people are going to respond to it because they know it's true. Carlson is uniquely dangerous too because all these pe- they're the exact same fucking asshole where you know they're either a gifted kid who is never afflicted with the greatest disorder of all time imposter syndrome. Or they're like an heir to was sort of ignominious but hyper wealthy dynasty, like you know, frozen dinners, like Tucker Carlson was. <laughs> and really true. Uh, they're all the, they have all the same like shitty personality where they know which way the wind's blowing and they'll switch on a dime. But Tucker's just the best at it. He's yeah. the best at knowing which way the wind's blowing. And he's also like one of the most. He's like this is you know as nebulous and stupid a talent as being good at podcasts, but he's like good at TV. He's talented at this this part of his career. He's verbally very quick. He articulates his thoughts in a way that like just like a normal ish person will watch and go, oh, that makes sense. While also selling you this complete just fucking psychotic blood and soil white nationalism. And yeah, you let him be the voice, the opposition to Max Boots, very good blog for precocious thirteen-year-olds uh, for endless war. We love to see it. Yeah, you love to see it. You love to see the future we have. Yeah, like if the VP of Cap is is basically of the Center for American Progress. If we can't rely on them to be like um, Max Boot and everyone who promoted the Iraq War should go away forever, they should. They have nothing of value to add to any current foreign policy debate or even any of the past. But to literally be like, actually, there's something to that. And uh, maybe Max Boot is right that we need to be at war on the imperial frontiers for uh, centuries. And not only that, like you point out, cut Social Security, Medicare, and every social program in America to do that. And if we're going to let the fascist right be the people to say, um, no, let's not do that, that's fucking dangerous. Mm-hmm. But it, it makes sense, though, and it's inevitable that the neocons are going to end up migrating to the democrats because it it, it is in so the they long started out exactly in the long stretch it's like a tidal gravity they started off as democrats they started off as sort of a, the intellectual class uh it, at the tail end of the liberal imperial hegemony after world war ii whose job it was to synthesize the needs of the american empire the, to do things like vietnam 
uh, with the self-conception that Americans had about what, who they were. And, and so they created this vocabulary of human rights and, and, and you know, uh, humanitarianism. Uh, and, but then uh, just as soon as they had created it and made a, a coherent thing out of it, the liberal moment ended and the conservative moment began. And because they just follow power, because they are there to be courtiers to power and to justify power, there's no point hanging around with Democrats. They got nothing to do. What hang around like, oh, you, you you hold the, the house. Congratulations. You know, that, that's as Nixon said, building outhouses in Peoria. What about world stage, the real power shit? So they had to go to the Republicans and they were like, hey, we have these this this vocabulary, this this language to talk about empire to, to sell it essentially to the American people to allow them to integrate something that should be horrible to their idea of what America is supposed to stand for. They did, we were going all these places, telling people what to do, murdering children. That's horrible. That has to be synthesized. And that's the whole, that was the, their position. That was what they brought to the Republicans was this vocabulary. And then they used it. it the, the height of it was during Iraq when they brought it all out and they were able to use a liberal language to sell this, this military adventure. Uh, and then when it fractured, uh, and the Republican Party kind of went into a, a nervous breakdown that resulted in Trump becoming president, they're on the right no longer had anything to sell because the Republican base no longer gave a shit about any of that stuff. Like they had looked, they had, they have to any degree that they ever even uh, ex- embraced those tropes as anything other than a cynical way to kind of undermine liberal opponents of war. Uh, by now they're done. They don't give a fuck. Like, you know, uh, I don't give a shit. I don't want a nation bill. I don't want to fucking uh, cry me a river. You know, I, th- we should we should be bombing to the extent that we need to to protect our homeland, and that's it. Uh, and and so what are, what are they supposed to do? They are superfluous on the right, but the liberal the Democratic Party never lost that. They never lost that need to to maintain a vocabulary for uh, empire that can uh, be sold to their base, who is more sensitive to that kind of thing. And so now they're the only game in town. And so, of course, the neocons are all going to end up going back to the Democrats. Yeah, and I, 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 well, just to add to that, I think one of the reasons that they're no longer wanted on the right is you know, the, the common tactic that you always saw throughout the Cold War, particularly in the Re- Republican Party, was if you opposed X or Y foreign policy, you were a communist. You, know, you supported the Soviets. And you've seen that over and over again with the beginning of uh, the war on terror. You, know, you, you support the Taliban. You support Saddam Hussein. And I think what Trump did, and this is why Trump is very useful, is he basically told the right what they really wanted to hear, and he and he attached it to being opposed to these foreign policies, at least nominally, Mm -hmm. you know, not not in reality, but nominally. So he basically freed up the right to really get down, you know, get get down to what they really care about, which is which is race war. Um, yeah, they want the, and, they, and they basically just want the death squads in this country. Right, exactly. Right. Right. So, yeah. so, yeah. so right. some some guy whining about, oh, we're we're gonna building hospitals in in Afghanistan for the for the girls. Like uh, Republican voters don't give a fuck anymore, yeah. but Democratic voters still do. They so, hear that and they start crying. What's they think of that fucking National Geographic cover. So what's interesting that tactic though of basically just smearing anyone who opposes the foreign policy with being on the side of whoever the enemy is at the time. That's moved to the Democratic Party now. I mean, that's part of the meaning behind you know we're we're all apparently agents of uh, Putin's government. They're bot, it's right. bots. Yes, right. because right. because anti-imperialism is coming from Moscow because <laughs> yeah. Russia doesn't want us to be the benevolent global hegemon we should be. Yeah, and Russia will be able to take over the entire world. Right. You know, the country that like, you know, is at this point just like uh half widows who are married to raccoons because they were technically <laughs> the legal brother of the guy who died when he do- when he dove head first into an empty swimming pool the country with the gdp of, on, like, uh, of like cook county illinois i thought diving head first into an empty swimming pool was a neocon thing <laughs> <laughs> good point uh yeah, no, but they're, that's what's they're, so they're going to do it. They're going to have the empire that the sun never sets on, not because of territory, but because they just piled up a mountain of discarded boat across vehicles <laughs> in harebrained stunts. Uh, yeah, no, they're going to do it. They got it. So that's that's why it's that's that's the dangerous moment. But also, as we were saying, it's a moment of possibility because uh, a lot of because uh, this is a clarifying thing to see, to be like, oh, these guys who we hated, these guys who sold this war that we find 
viscerally horrible, and or at least we did five, ten years ago. They're ba- they're on our, they're on our side now, and they're explicitly telling you that the reason they're on your side is because we need to prop up this machinery. We need to find a new uh, like marketing sector to appeal to to prop this up to keep this brand sellable for until the fucking wheels come off. And if that's the choice, yeah, like people are going to be like, no, what, 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 what is the point of this? Like, are you going to give me a, a, like a tax incentive to, you know, like uh, open a, a ski do dealership and then my three of my kids get uh return home and fucking uh, takeout bags. Well, you, you end, you end your uh, piece by uh, for bring, making a contrast between uh, the max boots of the world and um, Andrew Basevich. Cause you talk about Andrew Basevich, who is a, a writer or yeah, is, you know, on the right, but he's a writer I actually quite admire as a very principled and morally serious anti-interventionist. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a guy that um, he, I think he got out as a colonel in the army. Uh, he served in the Vietnam War. Um, he is, you know, a distinguished professor of international relations or he was emeritus now at, at Boston University. His son uh, served in the army and got killed in 2007 in the Iraq War. Uh, and he's one of the most, you know, I say, most one of the more most uh, perceptive critics of of uh, American foreign policy around, at least in in the United States. And uh, you know, I, yeah, and I draw that contrast between him and Boot, and it's precisely because Basevich is the opposite of Boot. That Boot is an MSNBC celebrity, yeah. and Basevich is is not a household and, name. And like you said, like yeah, and then Basevich doesn't have all the like the stupid um you know illusions and stories that people like boot tell themselves like but but because of that he's a guy who is morally serious about what american foreign policy and the military what the use of our military and war and statecraft is actually like yeah and like what it actually means and there isn't that like i said that that self lobotomizing that goes on that like separates the consequences of policy from the people who do them or the people who decide them for the people it, the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking a little earlier about my own history, and I think if you're young and you believe all the bullshit about America, you either join the military and fight the wars, or you join a, th- uh, a think tank. <laughs> the, you and, fight the and real one of the, the reasons, mind wars. Yeah, and, <laughs> and one of the reasons the foreign policy blob is just so like evil and disgusting is like you have to be, be pretty evil and disgusting to support the wars when you're a young person and not actually join and instead join a fucking think tank in Washington, <laughs> yeah, D.C. Yeah, yeah. So so these no are the shit. people we're dealing with. Now, there's some good people, you know, who end up in these think tanks. I don't want to tell, you know, smear all of them, but yeah. Too broad a brush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the general dynamic. I I'm sorry. I, it takes some sort of courage to eat nothing but think tank like crudite all day, every day. <laughs> the goal the goal isn't to get fired for your cause. It's to get the other son of the bitch fired for his <laughs> cause. <laughs> Just eating room temperature rolled up deli turkey. <laughs> well, you don't you don't like eating adult lunchables <laughs> while uh the Kagans spin you an epic yarn about the time that uh they played blackjack with uh, the fucking minister of cars for Liechtenstein. <laughs> you don't like that? You don't think that's like a fun way to spend your life? Uh, well, the uh, you know, uh, you said you, you joined the Marines when you were nineteen, and because uh, you know, well, you a little sort of, older, a little yeah, older, yeah, but yeah. like you, you sort of like believe the same things Max Boot did. Like, did you have any like? Was it just the experience of like actually doing it that like disabused you of that, or was there like a road to Damascus moment? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'll be honest with you. The moment I joined, the moment I showed up at boot camp, I was like, shit, the world isn't what I thought it was. <laughs> and, and um, you know, it was a gradual kind of shift from, from then on. But obviously, once I made it to Afghanistan, I saw the distinction. I talked about that a little bit from the front lines and the flagpole. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, th- that's really what I write about is that just that gap between what it's actually like on the front lines, not just the front lines of our wars, but like, you know, the front lines of the class war, the front lines of, you know, the, the police, mm-hmm. you know, um, policing war um, and, and what, you know, what the pundits write about. And they're the flagpole. I mean, that, that's that's why they believe what they believe is they've spent their entire lives just right next to that damn flagpole at, but the, I guess like, at the big base. Yeah. Going, going back to the point I was trying to articulate yeah. a little bit earlier about how it's like, you know, generally apolitical and non-ideological to be like slavery, not just the slavery or like the Jim Crow was evil. But like the people who engaged in it, like that individual slave owners are were evil. They were evil people, like participating in an evil institution. And that's the connection that's never made with foreign policy. 
is that like that there yes there are evil effects in the world and now it's uncontroversial to be like ooh Vietnam War ooh oopsie that was a bad one but it's always in the terms of like well you know it was done it was just like the, we had the best of intentions and that like it's never like the people who make the decision the proactive decision to start a war are evil or the people in the think tanks who you know sell it or create policies to justify it like the, there's never the connection between Elliot Abrams and fucking you know Guatemala absolutely yeah I mean um, even if you acknowledge that what happened in Central America was evil there's no connection that like the people who carried it out or made it happen are evil. Like, yeah. I mean, not to use like the cliched example, but you know, Eichmann only went to one of the camps once and he was just sickened by it. He never personally killed anyone. So, but, well, so see, everyone has good in them. <laughs> so, so the people in the people in charge of our, you know, the people creating the narrative in our media and our government, you know, in my mind, they're not all that different than the tankies that cheered on the invasion of Hungary in, in 56 and the invasion of Czechoslovakia, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in, in, in 68 and, uh, you know, the, Af the Soviet war in Afghanistan in the 80s, you know, these are like Brezhnev, Brezhnev, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, like apparatchiks, you know? And then Don't you worry had, about it. There's going to yeah. be an insufferable argument on the yeah, subreddit. No, no that matter sound what. you just heard yeah. was the Chapo subreddit. All right. Yeah, I, don't wanna, yeah, 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 yeah. I apologize. I'm going to gonna, the I'm gonna take there, the fire yeah. from you. Yeah, yeah. All those countries, they're part of greater Poland. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I just want to say like, so then so then the the. Soviet Empire falls, and you come up with this big book, the Black Book of Communism, which right. like everyone loved in, in the United States. You know, if we survive the climate apocalypse, like at some point there's going to be a Black Book of, of capitalism or a Black Book of imperialism. Yeah. It's going to be obvious to everyone that we lived in an incredibly evil moment, that all the fuckers on TV, TV defending that moment were all really evil. The problem yeah. is we're not there yet. Well, I, I think we're hopefully kind of getting there. And I, I was, a, a, yeah, I was impressed with the relentless pushback on uh, Kelly Magsman and everyone else who tried to claim that let's not caricature Elliot Abrams. And Don't caricature the strength that he brings. <laughs> yeah, you could take me to the boardwalk in Atlantic City and draw a picture of me flying a tiny biplane with my worst facial features, highly exaggerated to make me some sort of comic object of scorn. If you do that to Elliot Abrams, it's on site, pussy. <laughs> uh, so I think we should issue a small corrective. Max Boot is not a chicken shit who didn't join the military and just chose to you know, do worksheets for his entire life so other people could die. Um, he medically wasn't able to join the Marines because he that is a medical hat. He has to dress like Bruno Mars from the chin up or he will die. And the Marines were not accommodating to him. They did not give him a combat bowler or fedora or even a pork pie, even a combat pork pie made out of Kevlar. And so we're issuing a full apology to Mr. Max Boot. Well, Jeremy Rubin, uh, I want to thank you so much for your article in The Baffler and for joining us. But before you go, uh, I think you need we should issue some shout outs. Yeah, I want to make a shout out to uh, my own squad, my Beer Summit squad. Um, uh, that's, this is what we call ourselves, believe it or not. They're the ones who sponsored my trip into the yeah, city. Shout, so out, I could be shout, here. Out, shout out to my friends, the stupid <laughs> cop and Henry Louis Gates, <laughs> Barack Obama. Damn, those are all your friends, dude. Sick. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot. So uh, Holden, DP Miller, uh, Jeremy, Poop Man Waddles. I'm not kidding. That's what we call him. Hell yes. And uh, Joe, off, Hen Poop Joe, Man. Joe Henderson. He, he doesn't have a middle name. Gang shit. <laughs> Gang shit. But yeah, they. they they're uh, they're, they're devoted Chapo fans who sponsored uh, your little trip to the city this weekend. Yeah, they're they're they're, uh, they're going crazy right now just listening to this. Oh yeah, so, and yeah, so so, so, is our, so is our Reddit <laughs> because you uh, criticized the invasion of Hungary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, stack I, of I, know, I, I, yeah, I, I won't say anymore. I'm just, I don't yeah. give a hey, shit. Hey, I don't give a fuck. Hey, hey, guess what, losers? Um, you want to have an opinion on the uh, invasion of Hungary? You want to yell at our guests? Guess what? Were you live back then? Checkmate. Shut up, bitch. <laughs> Argument over. <laughs> Forums defeated once again by logic. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, you think it was good or bad? Uh, guess what? Are you Brezhnev? <laughs> then you don't really know. Shut the fuck up. So, yeah, that about does it for us today. But before we sign off um, on a more somber note, I we do have to make note that the Chapo family uh, has experienced a loss over the last couple of days of, you know, a presence that has become a was a you know, sort of major character in the creation and, you know, it, it Chapo as yeah. an institution and as a family. Who can't forget uh, Felix and Will failing to scoop a, a 
box of uh, ketchup. I, Alex said this last night. Did you know the first ever Alex Nichols episode? That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Ernest took the nastiest shit ever. <laughs> yeah, in case like, you haven't figured it out, we I, I do want to say a sincere rest in peace to the good boy, Amber's beloved cat, Ernest, yep. uh, passed away uh, at... at what 57 50 years, yeah, years yeah, yeah. old he's like winston churchill's fucking parrot but no uh uh amber couldn't be here obviously uh, i think this would be She's emotional for her but uh we we will miss Ernest very dearly he was a major was part a of cat. uh really the, yeah, the show boy. so many of the so many of the early episodes of the show were recorded at amber's house with Ernest, you know crawling around on us um and then in one classic golden chapo moment um uh, almost ruining an episode by filling his litter box while we were recording. <laughs> uh, Ernest, uh, you will be missed, but you were a good cat, and you were all cats go to heaven. He's uh, he's shitting up heaven right now. He, he was the heaviest, sweetest boy. <laughs> he was so he was like he was like you you looked at him and you're like that's a pretty big cat, but I've seen bigger. And then he he crawled on you, and it was like a kettlebell. <laughs> But he was so he was so affectionate. He was like a dog. Uh, he was just he had so much personality. Uh, he had a great life though. He did indeed. And he was he was on uh, Fent for the last yes. couple of years yeah. of it. So you know he went out good. He had a great great life. Yep. So good for him. But no, he we'll uh, miss him. He passed so peacefully much. at home uh, in his favorite bed. And uh, like I said, our condolences to Amber and R.I.P. to the good boy Ernest. And I think we should go out playing the clip of yes. in this yeah. house, the cat makes the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, guys. Bye. Oh, man, that cat took a massive shit. That oh, man. Horrible. This is, oh, God, what is that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I need more. <laughs> you, never have back. That, you never had his Oh, my God. I wish I was there to smell it. <laughs> I'm so uncomfortable. Oh, my God. <laughs> it smells awful. This, this is, is so terrible. bad. Why don't you guys just put newspaper down or something? We don't have newspaper. We're not a print household. We're a digital <laughs> I need to leave. <laughs> oh, you real? I really gotten used to it. You? I know. <laughs> I know. Should, should we power through, guys? Oh, yeah. Whatever. I wish it, I should need to get some Febreze. Is there anything we can do at all? Yes. Can, we, can, we take, can we take a break for a second? Yeah. Uh, all right, look, keep keep rolling. I don't guys. understand this. Is it is it illegal for you guys to fucking scoop it? Is I, is there like a law against scooping it? Just Felix, pick up the poop. Just Felix can't it, hear you, Matt. Put it in a bag and yeah. throw it away. Yeah, That's what I have a cat. It's illegal for me to do that. I'm not this doing is not that. My cat. Matt, you have a cat. Is this all going to be kept in the final show? I yeah. hope so. Yeah. No, uh, no, well, I'm going to shorten this. This should be but, bonus for uh, ten dollars subscribers. Well, you get uh, ten uh, minutes well, of us cringing before we started to actually record. Alex, you said you were going to. Uh, do do a supercut of Chapo and Come Town all the times that the cat has just shit in front of us or thrown up. This is yeah. One, baby. At some point, I'll have to get to that. This is going to be. This is a great addition. Take him out! What yeah, is, he's. What, what are you people doing? He's <laughs> throwing out the window. I mean, you. Do you not have a procedure for cleaning a cat box? I'm going to freeze. It's like the simplest way to do it. Just throw it all out. Yeah, just take. Let's throw it we'll, out. We'll help, but let's take the. <laughs> well, just yeah. let's dump it. Let's just dump. Uh, go outside. Dump, you, you have dump a it out the window. Yeah. Dump it out the window. Alex keeps saying to dump it out the window, but we, but we should definitely get rid of it. Cause why, why, why would is there not like a plastic bag? I want to take one per hour. Felix is doing it, guys. He's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it. Oh, this is the worst episode we've ever done. Yep. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> this is what people like about our show, is the, uh, is, the, is the badness of it. It's endearing. I'm just glad it's gone. Oh, it's better. Oh, thank God. Uh, segwaying out of our, 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 that cat shit sketch that we wrote and prepared for the show. That's pretty good. That went down well. Um, 